Wonderful. So with this, uh, my name is Adam Block. I am chair of the uh, Needham Council of Economic Advisors um, and finding a quorum of members present, I call this meeting to order. Uh, this meeting is being conducted in a hybrid manner consistent with current state regulations and is being recorded. Anything that you state uh, uh, in the room and also on uh, Zoom for those that are present by Zoom, uh, will be um, will be recorded. Um, uh, the CEA doesn't often uh, uh, open its meetings up for public comment, but today we have a very specific agenda, which is uh, to focus on uh, Needham's plan for compliance with the MBTA communities law that most of you in the room, I'm sure, are familiar with, which is to um, uh, which is Massachusetts' uh, effort to. Uh, partially address the housing shortage. Um, uh, and one of the best ways to do that, of course, is uh, to uh, um, incentivize housing production to get cars off the road through the transportation nodes. And fortunately for us in Needham, you know, we have four uh, transportation stops uh, uh, just on the uh, commuter line itself, which is great. So I think we have a number of people um, uh, present uh, uh, in the room, and I'm not sure who else we have present uh, um, by Zoom. Uh, and if um, uh, and if there's, I th I think I see. Um, uh, I don't know if it's Patrick or uh, which Agato it is, but if we could elevate them to a panelist. Um, that will be helpful. And then uh, perhaps all the other attendees as panelists that might also uh, be fruitful for this work specifically because in addition to the feedback that we're, uh, the town is interested in receiving from CEA members, we've also opened this meeting up so we can solicit feedback and any guidance that can inform our public policy through uh, other stakeholders in our community that include attorneys uh, representing um, specific, perhaps uh, specific clients that have uh, commercial properties within town or residential properties um, and um, uh, 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 lenders and so forth. So we're grateful for everyone's participation today. And I think at this point, uh, JP, if, you, if uh, you're okay, including if you're okay, I'd probably uh, turn this over to, uh, in a moment, to Heidi and to Bill, who will present the current three models that Needham is uh, exploring for compliance, and we'll talk about the process. And then once they finish their uh, their presentation, then uh, we'll open this up for uh, CEA feedback and more general feedback and conversation. We do ask, in the uh, interest of all the people that are present today, to try to keep comments to three minutes. And if someone has already said something that you agree with, if you simply state, uh, you can simply state, I agree with the previous speaker. So that uh, I think um, handles our um, uh, speaking guidelines. Uh, and with that, Heidi and Bill, I'm happy to turn it over to you. Thank you, Adam. So hello everyone, my name is Heidi Farrell. I'm a member of the, the Needham Select Board and co-chair of the Home Committee, along with Natasha Espada, who I see is joining us uh, on the Zoom, um, who is the uh, vice chair of the planning work. So um, I'm glad that you could all join us today. Uh, basically, we wanna walk you through the MBTA communities Wait, first. Sorry, let me stop and introduce uh, the members who are here from the Home Committee. Uh, so Bill Lovett, obviously, and you get to chat in just a second. Um, Lee Newman, Katie King, Michael Diener, Amy Hansen, Alex Klee, and then I think Josh Levy is on the Zoom as well as um, Natasha as well. Um, so uh, basically, we just want to introduce to you, make sure that everyone understands what MBTA communities law is and what it isn't. Um, we're trying to, uh, as Adam mentioned, um, make it make zoning possible that allows for multifamily housing in Needham according to the MBTA community law. But in addition to rezoning to be compliant, 
we are interested in having actionable zoning and making sure um, that, that this change in zoning will result in some housing production. So we wanna make sure that you as a development community um, agree <laughs> with our assessment of what's necessary, that you feel that this is something that you can work with. And so we want to show you kind of where we're headed with this and get feedback from you as far as what you think would make uh, some production economically feasible. So, um, Bill, you can add? Sure. Uh, so, Bill, I was appointed by the planning board uh, as a real estate development uh, representative for the committee. And just to echo what Heidi said, you know, I think today is a good opportunity to not just provide input overall, but provide input and thoughts on how it can be built um, as we progress through this process, which has been a, a Fantastic process as well. A lot of input. So maybe we'll just throw ourselves right into the presentation that we have here. Um, yeah, you want the mouse? Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right. So MBT communities. Um, at its heart is a plan to increase the zoning that allows for production of housing by right. So without a trip for a special permit or a trip to the county board. Wrong sorry. Um, so there are some basic uh, tenets here that we need to follow. Um, we need to have one district of reasonable size um, in which multifamily housing is permitted as a right. As I said, we can't restrict age or any other um, we can't restrict the number of bedrooms, for example. So this is supposed to be multifamily housing and it'll be sort of determined by the market. Um, we must have a minimum gross density of 15 dwelling units per acre. And most of, in Needham's case, 90% of this district must be located within a half mile radius from a commuter rail station. And as uh, Adam mentioned, we have four. Uh, we are focusing our maps on the three that run along Highland Avenue. Uh, we have, for the moment, left Hersey out simply because um, we can't easily make a compliant district here. So we're going to focus on these three. And of course, as we all know, this is because uh, Massachusetts has a wild housing shortage. And Needham does too. This is not just about state production. Needham has uh, massive challenges when it comes to housing. And we know that because even before the law was passed, Needham established the Housing Plan Working Group to study needs having housing needs and found the exact same thing. We don't have enough housing and we don't have a wide enough variety of housing to suit the, the folks who live here or who want to live here. Um, in addition, all of the housing is financially difficult to attain, um, if not impossible for some. And that really puts us at a disadvantage economically um, when competing for businesses, for talent, because our employees can't live here. Um, so placing housing near transit is good economic policy, transportation policy, climate policy, and of course housing policy. And so built into that is all of the constraints of this law. So we are a commuter rail community, that's fairly obvious. And our deadline to pass our housing zoning changes is December 31st, 2024, so this year. And here you can see um, need them specific requirements. So we need to have at least 50 acres. We need to add a potential unit capacity within our district of 1,784 units at a density of at least 15 dwelling units per acre. And yeah. um, so just to be clear on the 1,784 units, that is I mean, something we want to make very clear. That is not necessarily mean an additional 700, 1,784 units. That means that if you were to wipe the slate clean of these areas, you could then build 1,784 units. There may already be 900 or 1,500 units in those areas. This just creates the zoning for that. And there's also, there's existing, there's what's already zoned to go into those locations. And then there's this uh, 1700, or you'll see in multiple scenarios, uh, 
additional potential debts here. So this does not just additional to what is in place. Sure, all zoning starts from the ground up. So we pretend that nothing is there, and then we zone, and then we see how much we could potentially build. And that's what that number represents. And notably, 90% uh, of this, as I, as I mentioned, has to be located within a half mile radius of the station. Okay, so this is uh, our timeline, and I want to I want to emphasize that this process started before the blue block all the way to the to the left, um, because we did start with the housing plan working group. The housing plan working group worked for a year. They held multiple public meetings. They had multiple processes for input, and came up with the Needham housing plan, which is what forms the basis for the zoning that we started with here. So even though it says that we started this September 7th, that's certainly when Cone launched, but it's not when the initiative began. Uh, so we started working September 7th. We've had many, many, many meetings. Um, I'm sure that everyone's anxious to catch up with all of those videos. Um, and then have already uh, held two very large public meetings. The attendance for both of our meetings was, was over 250 people attending both um, in person and online. Our last community meeting had just about 300 people. Um, and we plan to have another one on March 7th. Um, there are a couple of sort of inflexible elements in this timeline though. So I want you to understand that um, we're utilizing every second between now and the time this actually has to be approved by town meeting. So when we say that we have to um, hand off our plan to HLC, the um, help me. Uh, Executive Office of Housing and Livable Communities. Thank oh, you. Formal known as DHCB. <laughs> um, it's important that we get their approval on this plan before we take it to town meeting. Um, that review can take up to 90 days, but as we just saw in Michael uh, Lexington, um, some of the plans have been rejected. And if we only have one chance at town meeting approval, we need to make sure that our plan is viable and compliant before we go there. So we need to have that, that state review that takes that takes approximately three months. And then we're gonna um, hand over not only the, the plan, but also the zoning, which is by our consultants who were hired for this project, hand it over to the planning board. Planning board will have their own public hearings. So this will be three rounds of public hearings on this topic. And then we will take it to town meeting, hopefully in October. Um, the state, then, and then we turn it over to the state for their approval. Okay, so we're gonna kind of jump right in because we'd love for the majority of this meeting to be feedback. Um, we put together three basic maps, small, medium, and large, uh, baby bear, mama bear, Papa Bear, whatever you'd like to call them. This is base compliance. All three of these are compliant. This one, I'm gonna just switch over to the map. This one starts with existing zoning borders, but uses densities from the housing plan that was put together. It produces precisely the number of units that we need to be compliant and doesn't go much further than that. It does keep the center business district as a mixed-use mixed district with no standalone multifamily allowed, so we are not able to count uh, the majority. The next plan you can see is slightly larger. This is the housing plan scenario. Um, it enlarges some of the boundaries. It Hi, enlarges, Yep. Yeah? Sorry to interrupt. Uh, this is all really helpful information. I wonder if we should also go back to um, uh, the spreadsheet for scenario A. I'd just like to highlight a couple of a couple of points from the spreadsheet. Yes. Because yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do that. I'd like to show the maps first, if you don't mind, and then we okay. can take a look at each one sort of in detail. But I want to just okay. let everyone sort of Thank see you. the differences. Thank you. Um, 
so this uh, <laughs> this plan is sort of the medium plan. Okay, it increases uh, the district boundaries and some density. And then we have a third plan, which includes uh, some general residence. It in increases the height and um, keeps some of the center business as mixed use, but also rezones the edges for some standalone multifamily in the center. So I'm just going to go back and we'll take a look at this in greater detail. Adam, did you have something specific that you wanted to, to look at? At each, in sure. each one of these? Sure. So I just, I think it's really helpful because I think there are a number of, uh, uh, um, commercial property owners uh, in the room that uh, might find it relevant as we compare between scenarios A, B, and C, uh, you know, the most significant dimensional regulations and what I can see here, and maybe you're able to point to it on the screen. Um, in scenario A, the height, uh, this is all allowed by right. There's no uh, special permit for this. There would be a site plan review uh, uh, and the height, uh, the regular, the key dimensional regulations are height in the A1 district, which we saw from the map and we can show again, is uh, the height is three stories. In the business district, which is where um, uh, I go for ice cream with my son at Cookie Monster, Cookie Monster, uh, that's a, store, a height of three. The Avery Square business district, uh, is 2.5, two and a half stories. Um, uh, this is not the overlay district. This is for the uh, underlying district. The Chestnut Street Business District has a height of three stories, and the Industrial District has a height of three stories. The floor area ratio for the A1 district is 0 0.5. There is no floor area ratio calculation under the business district. The Avery Square Business uh, District has an FAR of 0 0.7. The Chestnut Street uh, Business District is 0 0.5, and the Industrial District is 0 0.5. Adam, and then, yes. Adam, I'd like to interrupt you for one second. I think something that's important to, for all of us to keep in mind as we look at all of these spreadsheets and maps is to remember that none of these are, are actual final maps. These are choices, and they're meant to be vastly different from each other to present a choice. To, to, there's supposed to be daylight between these. So I just want to just make it clear that we're not here to choose between these maps, um, and that wasn't the, the aim of the public forum either. The, the, the idea is to try to find the, the just right fit for Needham, and so in this group, that means what would you need to see to be attracted to doing some development in Needham? So definitely, uh, I think looking at um, the stats here is, is worthwhile, but I don't want anyone to get tied to what these stats are because we just make these up. We can make up different ones. We are looking to see where we would need to fall to find that tipping point for you all. I, I think that that's all great points. I think some of the feedback we'd be interested in specifically, and this maybe goes without saying, is you know height, parking requirements, um, you know those are the types of what what makes a project constructible and buildable. How much area do you need? Is there a minimum lot size that you need, or a minimum number of units? I think those are the types of feedback which are guided by you know some of the input on these charts that we need to keep in mind. Uh, and, and locationally, relative to, you know, our, our parking ratio is different if you're you know, half a mile away from a station or if you're across the street from a station. Those are, those are the types of ideas and thoughts. Yeah, so maybe use these as a starting point, but tell us what you like, tell us what you hate. 
Um, could you also just comment on the color code? Because I didn't see a key anywhere. And is there something that we should be mindful of as sure. we're thinking about what the colors mean? So let's see. There, there's the key right there. But it doesn't. Yeah. Ha it do I don't know what like A1 means. What does that mean? Or right. What does B mean? Uh, it's a, it's a, so these are the existing zoning districts. So A1 is an existing district right. and each for of those. Apartments, right? Um, in our apartment. zone. So it's an 18 unit per acre density yeah. in apartment mm -hmm. one. Um, I don't, I don't offhand know all of them. I think we it, it, if, you, if you match the color code with to that with this, diagram, yeah. then yeah. that's what the so the grid shows A one and are. the zoning exactly. levers. So B is like business. Then B is okay. Um, then. When you yeah. we, you. we have this little survey out, and yeah. uh, on that survey, all of that is on one page, which is you know exactly what you're asking for, which I can't provide right now, but we it does exist and uh, together. Okay, I no, that's see where it's, that makes it a little harder. <laughs> So um, would you, what would be helpful? What would be the best way for you all to see what you need to see? Shall I go to the, the stats for the other maps? Or do you want to talk through how this might work or ask some questions? If it's helpful, I could provide a, just a brief summary of the comparison of the dimensional regulations uh, so people have a sense of what the differences are at a fairly high level. Um, I, so I was mentioning the floor area ratio, the, uh, as Bill mentioned, uh, parking. And then uh, there's also um, uh, the, the uh, number of units per acre. All of you know your own additional dimensional regulations like minimum lot size and setbacks that also need to pencil out. And yet, just to top line the differences between scenario A and B and C, it becomes more permissive by right. So the floor area ratio, um, the floor area ratio in plan in scenario uh, B, for instance, uh, uh, has uh, the uh, center business district, which is not included in center in the scenario A, as an FAR of 1.0. But in scenario C, which includes a broader geography, number one, and number, uh, which is to include more districts, it's also more permissive within the districts. So the, um, uh, so the floor area ratio rises uh, to 1.0 in the apartment one district, and then it's 1.5 FAR in the business district, the Avery Square Business District, the Chestnut Street Business District, uh, and also in the uh, now including the Hillside Avenue Business District, and a new, uh, and a center uh, uh, business district uh, of one point two five, um, and then the height is also more permissive uh, as as we proceed along uh, uh, proceed along scenario B and in particular scenario C, where we see the height is as uh, well it's 4.0 for the A1 district in the business district. Uh, it's five stories in the Avery Square business. Again, this is all by right is five stories. The Chestnut Street business district is five. It's also five in the CT. R R district, which I think is what is Lee, what is the C T R R? The center wraparound district. Okay. So a new district kind of created here. And then in the hills in the Hillside Avenue business district, it's uh four, uh it's a height of four stories in the general residence, it's two and a half. And then in the industrial district, it's four and a half. So again, the point is as we um, go through with these different scenarios, there are, it's more permissive. And the same would be true with the uh, units, uh, the units per acre, which are at eight, we saw at 18 uh, units an acre in the A1 district, the Avery Square business district, and in the Chestnut Street business district under scenario A. But in scenario C, uh, um, as an example, the uh, the uh, number of units per acre 
in A1 goes from 18 to 24. In the um, business district, which is down, effectively downtown, uh, is 50 units an acre. The Avery Square business district would be 50 units an acre. And that's consistent with the Chestnut Street business district, the center uh, of town wraparound district, and also the uh, Hillside Avenue business district. The industrial district is, uh, you know, have under this model, 26 units per acre. So uh, like Heidi, I think was saying a minute ago, none of these are set in stone. They're, these are just models to elicit feedback of what <clears throat> makes sense for the pros in the room and for the town, balancing all of the town's interests. And Adam, I don't know that we're gonna go district by district in this forum. I think this may be more of a, let's get a general consensus of what is a buildable, if that sounds reasonable. Absolutely. Like, this with feedback from that. Yeah, I mean, in this group, I'm gonna go out on a limb and assume that you're all in favor of that C. Uh, it's the tallest, <laughs> it's the densest, right? But help us understand why. I mean, beyond the obvious, please. What makes it possible for you to start a project? What makes it appealing to 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 get a project underway? How can we um, how can we ensure that housing production is possible? What conditions need to be met to make projects attractive? Are, are we to listen? Do you want us to listen or can we offer our opinions as well? Go ahead. Because I, I have some thoughts. Yes. Yeah, um, I think that the uh, parameters have to look much closer to this than in the other scenarios in terms of height, density, parking requirements, um, floor area ratio. Uh, the other, other parameters are just simply too close to the current zoning that we have, and that doesn't encourage redevelopment. Can, um, can you help us understand where's the tipping point? What's the minimum possible uh, that, that would be attractive? It, that's that's hard to pinpoint <laughs> at, at, at this point, but any project, it all depends on what you're trying to accomplish. If you're trying to accomplish getting a number of units and making sure that you have affordable units, then the project has to be economically feasible for a developer to come in there, buy the property, do all the construction, and, and at the end of the day, not lose his shirt. Sure. Because you know, development is is a risky business. Sure. And I, I should I should say and I should have addressed at the beginning that the law actually constrains the amount of affordability that we can mandate for mm -hmm. any of this zoning. So the, um, their benchmark is 10. Um, it can go higher than that, but we would have to, to prove the feasibility of going higher. Uh, and that's a it's a pretty high bar actually. So just FYI. For for in my opinion, scenario A and, and B, uh, it's too constrictive. You have height restrictions. You have minimum lot. I mean, go into the business center of business and and try to find a ten thousand square foot lot doesn't meet the requirements. Sure. Sure. Okay. Uh, uh, the FAR, you know, like I said, the height, the, the minimum lot size, all of that stuff uh, constricts the amount of development that you can do and makes it economically infeasible to be able to go in there and and, and build. Mm -hmm. And you know, keep in mind too, we're, we're sort of beholden the fact that we are in a very affluent, economically viable town. So this is we're talking redevelopment. I'm talking about Absolutely. so that means you're talking about knocking down a, a profitable occupied building and assuming that risk to put something back up. Mm -hmm. You're not going to do all that, incur that risk, the time involved with that, and then just put back what you have already, right? It's got to be it's got to be more. Otherwise, I mean, if we want to see something happen, it's got to be more. It's, it's got to it's got to incentivize a developer to do that. Mm -hmm. And to, to add to that, with the fractional ownership. Yes. Of, of a lot of these areas of now you have different owners having to agree to sure. sell their property to to allow uh, the minimum of, uh, construction to, to yeah. take place all right one some of our guests have have uh, things to say can, can i just ask you to um 
Say your yeah. name for the record, please. One other thing I would mention is the parking yeah. is a very complicating factor because these sites are in quasi urban areas. So there's just not a lot of surface area. Mm -hmm. And so that means if you want to have parking and density, you have to go underground. And that's really expensive. Well, one thing I'll point out about both scenarios B and C is that we've reduced the parking requirement to one. Uh, so just. Yep. Uh, here I'm, <laughs> um, I'm Jeremy Helfern, I'm a CEA. Uh, I am not a real estate guy. I'm a, but I do come from the land of technology. So I'll ask a technology question, which is there must be a model that the developers use that has yield on investment against purchase price, against cap rate. Like someone has a model. I have to imagine that we can plug some of these in and play with variables and come up to your question of where's the break point of what do we need in each of these variables? And I'm sure they're interconnected. So as you pull one piece of the spider web, things change. Um, but I, I would say, so I, I don't know if we've looked at any of those models or if we have something that we can, we can utilize. And two, even if we have something that's theoretically attractive, to your earlier point, I guess the question is, is how do we make it actually attractive? And part of, I think, the CEA's job is to figure out, is it TIFs, is it loan guarantees, is it, is it something, or is it just a zoning change that's going to transition it from a theoretical compliance problem to a you know, we actually have more housing stuff. Sure, sure. But it'd be nice if the zoning got us most of the way there. Based on the comments, I'm concerned <laughs> <laughs> that with no other change, um, that a mere zoning change is going to like magically unlock fractionalized property that someone's going to take on redevelopment. Okay. One of the things he's talking about, some of us in business refer to it as squeezing the balloon, you squeeze one in and it shows up on the other. This gentleman over here made a great comment about the parking. Well, you can solve that by having parking underneath the building. If you do that, now all of a sudden in scenario A and B, you, you've used a, uh, a floor mm -hmm. for parking. So now you've reduced the, the number of floors you have uh, to inhabit. And that, again, that, that works against the feasibility from an economic standpoint. Just, just a follow-up question. Can you make zoning that is in fact Referential, meaning that if you do X, then Y happens, or do they have to be fixed numbers? So let me ask. Thanks. I think that there are mechanisms to do that. That's what we have in mind. It meaning, like, five as you add five. parking, mm -hmm. maybe you need less, you know, you get more uh, relief on some of the other criteria, right? Or whatever. So I can give you an example of sometimes it's done in certain states with affordable housing, right? If you do X percent of affordable housing, you can get an additional you know, 25 dips of uh, density, right? So there's take home density bonuses. So there could be an incentive to move away from parking and increase density on the other side of that. Which presumably, if we're trying to do something that's encouraging mass transit, less parking <laughs> seems to be the order of that. But then the, the, the question to the development community is. Is the unit as valuable without parking? Will people in a suburban community demand parking? Yes, and maybe like going two car for one car. The but these thing. are all these are the questions that we should be discussing. Did you have a question, Zach? I did, yeah. So, uh, Tim Sullivan, uh, Needham resident, but also an attorney here on behalf of um, uh, um, the Goulds and Stores, on behalf of the owner of 100 West Street. Um, 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 so, I guess to some of these points that have been made, at, with respect to 100 West specifically, I know this is come out because of the quality of meeting. Um, it would be good in any of the scenarios, understanding that maybe you don't end up with just A, B, or C, but to have sites like 100 West that already have density on them included at the density they're at. So, you know, for people who maybe haven't followed the site, 100 West has been approved for age restricted, but about 200 units. So, that really should be a baseline. And my opinion, understanding. <laughs> I represent the owner. Um, uh, that should be a baseline here because it's density that's already there. It's already been approved. It's been, you know, thought about. So that to me seems like something important. Getting beyond that site specific, I would say just having represented developers. Um, the question about mixed use or not, I would suggest flexibility would be good because I think it should tie someone to having to have retail on the first floor. 
that might be yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 just I think allowing a developer mm -hmm. to go through the process and if that makes sense to yeah. incorporate yeah. it, but I'm yeah. telling yeah. not is a, a better way to approach it. I've represented content so you have and the first floor retail so yeah. yeah. it's a requirement that we did yeah. it, it's done, but there's no tenant for it. You know, so I think it, and I think we should think about soliciting input from people who own property in these districts because I've had people contact me and say, my site, I, I own a couple properties, they're in two different districts. What do I do about that? You know, so I think to get some input from people who own property who might do 10 units if their sites were in the same district and subject this could be helpful. So I think soliciting input from people who might own property that would do something would be useful in this process. Absolutely. Timmy touched on a good point too specific to MBTA. So the MBTA, in order to be included in the MBTA, and I'm oversimplifying this, it's correct for my care, but if it's included in the MBTA district, it has to be 100% residential by right, condo or apartment. You can't require um, a commercial space there. So there's been some discussion in some of the public meetings about, you know, then do you want to allow 100% residential by right in like the core of downtown media or you know there's arguments both ways some people think that that having 100 percent residential in those areas would enhance the small businesses in the community others think that it's downtown so you should mandate uh, and require storefronts on the first floor which also Lee, leads to licensing Lee can you provide some clarity on that my understanding was that for instance uh, with a mixed use scenario, obviously the first floor retail would not uh, is not applicable. But what? Uh, but the residential units above are counted at a discounted rate at like twenty five percent, um, which would go towards the you know the the stated goal of, for instance, uh, in scenario B as an example, the capacity is a little over twenty six hundred units. So is uh, is that correct that the twenty five you can count twenty five percent of your residential units above retail that would contribute towards the twenty six hundred is that right? Well, there's a. I mean, he's correct. If it's going to be in the MBTA, if it's going to be counted under the MBTA Act, it has to be standalone housing down to the ground floor. But there is a provision that allows you to take a mixed use district where you're not, um, where that, and there are certain rules that apply to that, to parameters within that mixed use district, and to count, um, I think it's a percentage of the housing units within that district um, against the number that you're required to have. So I think it was in scenario A that was actually done to come up with a 1,784 total. <coughs> Um, where the build up for the district, I think, showed, I think, around six, little over 1,600 units. Then there was an offset um, of 337 units based upon um, the, the build up for that, for that zone. Okay, so that is correct. Josh uh, Levy, thank you very much, Lee. Josh, I see your hand is up. Oh, thanks, Adam. Uh, I had a question. Uh, though, so the zoning is, is clear that it has to allow standalone housing by right I, I think there is an option to as an op an optional uh allowance to have mixed use as an option um i said optional many times there <laughs> i'm wondering if that is helpful from a builder's perspective to have that option of mixed use or whether standalone housing is attractive enough uh, to build on its own <laughs> Uh, Greg Petrini, Petrini Corp, even based developer for nearly 80 years, own properties in almost all of these districts. I, I, I just unorganized organize thoughts. Uh, I think that that's a very good question, Josh. I think it depends where you're developing. If you're developing in an A1 district, I think ground floor residential works. I think if you are in the center business district or the commercial districts, it's better serves the community and the vibrancy of the downtown to have first floor commercial. Well, I don't know how you get around that. Um, it seems to me low-hanging fruit is the A1 apartment district. If you are looking for a matter of right development district in areas that has worked well for residential for decades, I don't see why you wouldn't blow the top off the zoning and allow, I'm serious, allow triple the density, quadruple, the, I mean, I'm talking about FAR, 
Um, maybe I bear upwards of two uh, densities in the 40 to 50 unit per acre. If you really want actionable development, you have to really compel developers. And I'm not, I'm not seeing a lot up here under any scenario that's going to motivate a lot of people to knock down a sound performing economic building and to put up something new, particularly when you introduce the affordability component, which is a real driver on the economic side of the project. We've looked at projects downtown and have plans on the boards, and <clears throat> Bob can speak to it much more clearly than I can. But we, we know what the densities are, we know what the FARs are to motivate development. And I'm not seeing it here at this time. Great, thank you, Paula. Um, at that FAR or height densities that are below the top off, does it still incentivize you if we got there, but it was still by special permit, not as of right? Yeah, to me, I don't, uh, Lee and Lee, and I don't know of any significant project in Needham that hasn't had to go through the planning board. I can't imagine a matter of right development in Needham knowing the review process and the politics of it. But if they introduce matter of right, it really doesn't, what really, what really sways me is units per acre, FAR, and all of the, the zoning um, criteria, not the approval process. Because if it's a good project and the town likes it, it'll get through the process. So if we had base zoning with an overlay that allowed more density or height with a special permit, that would be a yeah, Special permit, the any experienced developer knows the special permit process is a necessary evil and a good project will get approved. I'm serious. A matter of right, I can't imagine building 60, 80 units somewhere as a matter of right. There has to be something that pulls you from the planning floor. So a matter so, of right doesn't really, doesn't really interest me. I mean, it doesn't really intrigue me all that much. So just to make, just to put a, a little clarity on on the point, which I think is an important distinction, um, we all it's it's true. Is, is was that Greg Petrini? I wasn't sure. Yes, same job. Hi, um, I then thanks for for being here for uh, participating and for your comments. I think those are very these are very helpful and specific comments, but I. Uh, if we were, so there's really a couple of different scenarios. One is for compliance with the MBTA, uh, even if we we blew the top off, so to speak, and this was by right, it would still fall under the requirement for a site plan review, which has different and lower thresholds of review and government oversight by the planning board than, uh, than a, a typical a uh, special permit by use. A special permit by use uh, provides effective, um, it's, uh, um, uh, um, you, know, you, you can almost, you can't quite reject it, but you, uh, it's a much more stringent bar uh, for a use special permit as opposed to uh, a site plan review. It's, uh, it's a little more, um, uh, one is more discretionary, you know, I guess, than the other. Um, so just to just to be clear that if we, you know if we did uh, have all of these um, uh, more permissive dimensional regulations, it would still be a, a you'd still come into the planning board for a, a, a site plan review special permit, but not a use special permit. So again, the threshold. You know the bar is lower than a traditional special permit. Yes, uh, Tim. Yeah, could I just offer one more thought on that? Um, from a site plan review standpoint, you could get to a lot of the same things you'd be concerned about on special permit, and you can reasonably condition it, but you significantly reduce the appeal risk that a developer or a lender is going to be looking at. So while you would still be in front of the planning board, having it by site plan review is going to be significantly more attractive to a lot of developers because you'll be a lot less likely to have it tied up in court for a longer period of time, quite frankly. Thank you. Can I ask a question, Tim? Just to put you on the spot, I don't know if you can hear me. Tim, can you hear me? Yep, yep I can hear you. Can you can you speak to the point uh, you made a comment about for lenders and you're talking about um, uh, you know, uh, the risk factors 
with the different review criteria. Can you explain what the um, how a lender looks at risk for these types of questions? Um, sure. I mean, some of the developers could probably speak to it just as, as well as I could. But I mean, you know, any of these projects are going to be looked at by people who are investing and spending money on them. And um, to have a site plan review approval, there's just much more surety on the appeal standard, frankly, that if it were appealed, you're much more likely to have the court uphold the planning board and the project, then there's more risk associated with a special permit because it's discretionary, frankly. Thank you. That's helpful. Are there are there any um, uh, uh, property owners in the room that may own uh, commercial retail, um, you know that uh, that we haven't heard from that may also have some additional comments or questions. Um, I was going to ask if any if anybody in the room sees that there are any missing elements that you would like to see. Um, you've already spoken about greater density and greater height. Anything else? We talked about lowering the parking requirement. What else are your major hurdles for most of your projects? Well, I'll speak. I'm Steve Dazzo, a developer with the Hanover Company, so I can only speak through the lens of you know being a big uh, multifamily, national multifamily developer who does projects upscale. So when I look through options A, B, and C, I'm really only looking at option C because we do projects that are two, three, four hundred units. I don't want to scare anybody, but <laughs> um, you know the one issue I see with option C is, and this has been addressed already, is the fractional fractional ownership component of it, and you're replacing operating businesses and everything. So I don't know who this question is for, maybe for you, Tim, but is there at this level has there been any discussion with EOHLC about expanding the zoning district to capture other areas of town that will help satisfy uh, your requirements because there are other areas that have larger parcels that you're not piecing together six or seven smaller ones but it's one or two and i'm saying that i'm, I'm you know thinking about the highway commercial the highland commercial the industrial along 128 the new england business district where there's already projects of scale over there and the parcels seem to be bigger. Um, so, you know, the, the big national multifamily perspective, that's kind of what I'm focused on. Uh, but there's, you know, I think what you're doing is great and there's a need for both types of housing and, you know, respect that there's other professionals here who do develop at a small scale that we do. I think part of that, if I can, <laughs> is, is that, um, you know, just Ninety percent of the units have to be within a uh, within a half mile radius of the stations. Right, and doing little business so yeah. be outside of that. Well, I mean, my question is: Is there a, yeah. a way to get leniency from that from the OHLC? Well, I what I was actually going to say, like, like I was going to say something very similar, but like, where else can we be building? Because it feels like even just doing base case compliance scenario might not incentivize a lot of downtown building and we could do like scenario C, but it still feels like that's never probably going to get us to the economic benefits and the other things that the town is seeking. And so it feels like if we vote on something like this, how like how much building do we actually think is gonna happen, right? We can go up to 4,782, but like how much of that is truly incremental though? You were talking about this, it's not all incremental. Um, and what percentage of that zoning requirement actually ever gets utilized? Like, I don't know, is it 25% is it 80%, right? Those are very different numbers from the number of people that will be like living downtown. Um, but I think that if we want economic benefits, if we want the other things that we're saying, we want people to feel like they have more affordable housing in need of and can live and work here, then I think that there needs to be like a, another scenario that incorporates like some building in other areas that make more sense for that, solving that piece of the puzzle. Yeah. Just wanted to comment. I, yeah. I really appreciate those comments. And, you know, part of the work of HONE is what makes sense to be in this MBTA communities right. district and what makes sense just to recommend for the town to do generally. So, you know, I think yeah. if you came into town today, 
it would presumably be like a friendly 40B discussion, right? Those tools are still available to you, to the town, et cetera. So it, I think part of this is what makes sense to put in this package, in this bucket, and what do we need to keep working on in other avenues? Because it's yeah. it's not going to solve all things for all, all people in all areas, um, but I, it's a uh, point well made. And all objectives. Like, what are our objectives? Yeah. What do we actually want the end result of this to look like? And then which different scenarios we need to like work on to get that result in place here. I'm Lee Selka, over 30 year resident of Needham and two, I'm just trying to get my head around this. I've just been in housing meetings in four communities for like months. Um, so one with the Hartley Graymount, um, I think it's Hartley Graymount parcel been allowed under this, any of these scenarios. Um, and secondly, what about the Hillcrest Gardens project? Would that be allowed under any of these scenarios by right? Could these builders have done this? So correct me if I'm wrong. Lee. The Hartney Gray, and you're talking about the proposal that went to town meeting specifically. Correct. Would they I have been able to build this at a height and density beyond what we're proposing? Okay. So even and what they wanted to build wouldn't have been allowed under this. Correct. And also too much work. And what? And it also had too much work. Okay. Yes. Okay. And but, then but they would have been able to develop just at a <clears throat> so, so that creates an economic kind of headbutting, right? Because the, the, there's a effectively a retail tenant paying to occupy that space. So then the, the potential developer has to look at how much they can afford to pay for the land. The seller has to make a determination as to whether it's more valuable as a cash flowing asset or to sell it. The lower the density is. So less likely is that, that becomes housing. And we're talking about Hartley Grammar? I'm talking about generally, but Gen oh, that's okay. pretty good. That's a pretty good example. Yeah. And will Dorenzo be able to build anything by right because he's within a half mile of the antenna? So, so he you makes, you know, what, how will that, I'm trying to figure out real impact on projects that I've been watching try to happen. Right. So it depends which map. <laughs> oh, so even so, a, a would not allow it. Okay, the first no. scenario would not allow it. More specifically, more specifically, under scenario C, there is a, a border. The the, uh, the plan of this scenario, as an example, is to expand the district, the A one district. Uh, so there's a pocket of it on the south side of Great Plain Avenue, uh, mm -hmm. up to Warren, which would include theoretically that parcel and then the question is under that district uh uh you know what are the dimensional regulations the last you know as an example the last uh concept i think that uh was brought forward to the planning board for general consideration it was not a formal application i think had a total of roughly 24 units that's on a half acre lot and under scenario C, the dimensional regulations would only permit half of that. Okay. So in other words, the dimensional regulations would only allow 24 units an acre. And he and that developer was proposing 50 units an acre in order for it to be economically viable. And I think in that scenario, um, in scenario C, the requirement is uh, one park, one uh, parking space per unit. We offhand or Alex, if you're there, I can't recall what that developer was proposing for a parking ratio <laughs> for that site specifically. Was it one or was it less than one? It might have been half. I don't remember off the top of my head without looking at the drawings. Right. Okay. So the parking was also an influencing factor. <laughs> to your question. Okay. Judy, can we turn this around? I, in, sort of in preparation for meetings like this, I was driving around. And this is a building in Brighton. <clears throat> and some of the stuff we're talking about, there are no setbacks here. It's built right out to the street. It's five stories. It has parking underneath and it has a retail <clears throat> on the first floor. But I don't know if you guys can see this. I don't think it's a bad looking building. A lot of people hear five stories and they're afraid of the height. Um, or they hear no setbacks and they're afraid it's going to be like a monolith or something like that. 
that's just an example, just driving around of what other towns are doing to be able to satisfy the kinds of things you're talking about. So picture's worth a thousand words, right? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, even like, I don't know if Wellesley's doing all their building because of these regulations, but if you go to where like Linden Square is, like, I mean, there's so much construction happening with multi-unit dwellings. This might not be applicable for Steve per se, but is there a number of units that is economically feasible for a developer on a <coughs> For smaller scale, not 200 units, but for, you know, is it 10 units? Is it 20 units? Is it 40 units? And what would generally make sense? I have an answer because I'm specific personally, but I'm just curious what, in Needham, what people think the market is. Can you do 10 units? And it's all based on the land, possible. right? I mean, you know, I, I think each property is a snowflake, you know, like, like they really are. Mm -hmm. And, and if you're, if you're developing in the suburbs, 250, 300 units is the sweet spot, but in a more urban location, you're looking at each property and what its limitations and opportunities are and do the best you can. There are fixed costs to any project whether it's 10 units or 250 units. Right. So it just makes sense economically. If you're gonna pay the same amount of those fixed costs for 10 units or 250, what's the yeah, Your management costs, everything, you know. Architectural. It's, it's efficiencies, right? Right. But from a, we, we, it doesn't seem practical to do, you know, three, 300 units. So, what is there? Some is there? Might there be a sweet spot from? Yeah, yeah I, I'll speak as an architect and a developer. <clears throat> you know, there are certain increments that help. You know, like you know, things like vertical cores and things like that. You know, you you hit certain points where it it's more efficient than if it were a slightly smaller or a slightly larger building, but. Each property is so unique, especially in a place like Needham, where you've got jigs and jogs and odd shapes. And it, it's really case by case. What's your number? <clears throat> to me, it's probably four. Would be, that would be something that might be, might make sense to build for. Yeah, I just I just looking around, I don't I mean 25 seems a little old. Um 40, you might just start to be able to get some density. You can pay for your elevator. Um, you know, you can you need the height to do it. Um and I'm not proposing that, I'm just saying that to me is for, for by the low end of the spectrum. Another one, another influencing factor on price and so forth, as we talk about the number of units, is the affordability uh, question. And Lee, are you able, or Katie, or anyone else in the room able to speak to whether that 10% affordability is a, a requirement of the MBTA? Uh, uh, and is that 10% based on the 80% area median income, or is it a lower threshold of 50%? I think they were, I think the state was allowing you um, as a matter of practice to incorporate an inclusionary zoning provision up to 10% um, and assuming that that would work across your proposal. And if you wanted to impose a higher requirement, you had to document that it was economically feasible. I think in the case of, of Needham, um, the consultant for the models that we have looked at so far ran the economic analysis and it really came back indicating that um, you could actually go up to 20%. Whether the town wants to go up to 20% or not is an open question, um, but that economically, according to the models that were run by the consultant, um, it showed that it was economically feasible. I think so in Needham, it, currently, it's, I think it's set at 12 and a half across most of the 
uh, districts where the rule is being applied. And that affordability level is at 80% AMI, not lower. Right. Yes. Yes. And, and uh, just for others that are also in the room, uh, the threshold for um, for affordable housing stock, I think is generally speaking 10% for the municipality. And if you've achieved that or more, then uh, 40B projects come in as friendly 40B, which enables the town to negotiate a little more flexibility with a developer as opposed to if a municipality has not achieved that 10% threshold of affordability of their entire existing housing stock. Is that true, Lee, that, uh, is that true? Yes, Needham debt, Needham debt at 10% right now. And so now any projects that come in above, above because we're, we're compliant, come in as what we call friendly 40 Bs. Um, and they're they're done through the LIP program. Lars, did you have something you want to say? Yeah, thank you. Uh, Lars, on your uh, multifamily developer, uh, me resident, I'm not developing any, anything here in town, but I guess the question, but it might change the answer to the, the question of how many units. Does MBTA communities require rental as opposed to condo? Because I would think the condo situation, you could certainly make the numbers work at a smaller number of units, might be bigger square footage per unit. But I just is curious if there's doesn't specify. Part, doesn't yeah. specify. So, so it might be another element here is smaller projects that are for sale where we have you know very affluent market here and make things work. And that 40 is, I mean, again, it's going to be very much contingent upon the size, the shape of the lot. I mean, that just you know, seems like you start to get some efficiency with that number. I'm not proposing it. I'm just. No, no, no. Yeah, I'm totally <laughs> don't always do that. Uh, all I'm saying is that on a rental, when you've got all your operating costs, and you're looking at a true yield on costs on a, on a long term basis as compared to a one time sale where owners would be willing to absorb more of those operating costs on an individual basis because it's an opportunity to own low maintenance housing costs over the trade. Just different government. Do we know how the affordable component is administered by the town? Is it, is it is 40B where the developers return this constraint or is it through the housing authority? Has that been determined yet? or? Um, well, the town monitors it. Basically, we have a monitoring agent that basically they're monitored, I think, on a on an annual basis, and we get basically get a report that indicates what the what, what the occupancy was in that unit and documents the fact that it, it still continues to be rented to a person who meets the income eligible. Is that what you're asking me? Yeah, but like when you reach that friendly 40B status that we have, do those return constraints go away, or is that still part? <coughs> There's no limited dividends or provisions or anything like that, like with a 40 year. So you, you can you can make as much money as you want on the market rate you know, it's, it's just that you, if you have that, if there's a town that establishes an inclusionary policy, you just have a certain number of affordable units that operate under the program. You don't have any of the other okay. restrictions, like you have a 40 B, right? You can only make 10% and you have to do profit sharing with that. that okay. Uh, Bob Smart, former planning board member. I don't have a client that's got you know, has an interest in, uh, in this particular uh, act or the implementation of this act. I am representing the Needham Housing Authority with its uh, Linden Chambers uh, project. Um, it's my understanding of the MBTA Communities Act is that uh, there's no requirement um, that any of the units be affordable. Uh, the town can impose it, but they don't have to. And I noticed in the, in the various scenarios that have been put up, uh, there's no mention about an affordability requirement. So I'd be interested in, as to where the, the committee is on that. I, my, my own view is that, you know, the main goal, there are two main, to me, there are two main goals here. Uh, one is one is to satisfy uh, the state requirements you know, to implement the act. The other is to actually produce units. And I, I, I'm not convinced that it, it, that it, that it makes sense to, to, to impose a significant 
affordable unit requirement, particularly on smaller projects. Maybe you require it when you get over a certain number of units, but you want to exempt out the first, you know, the smaller projects, anything under 10 or 20 or 30 or whatever. Uh, and, and with the understanding that you're not going to get any affordable units if nothing is built. And it's, it's only with the larger projects that you're going to get a significant number of affordable units anyway. So don't require it at a, at a low level. That's, that's the norm. Thank you. We appreciate you joining us today and participating in this. And if you, if anything, you know, any brain waves come to you after you've left here, please feel free to reach out to JP or to um, the planning uh, department because we'd love to have your input. So, thanks for being here. Does anyone else have any other questions? Uh, is is Dave Downing in the room? I am. <laughs> Call yeah. out. And, and is up. Yeah. yeah. The focus has been the focus has been on residential, but I think Greg and Tim pointed out a few things on um, the retail. Um, and so I'm a Needham resident, but I'm also a retail advisor and broker um, that works in kind of the greater Boston area. And Adam asked me to be here. I think for a little perspective on the retail. And, it seems like to me, I think, um, you know, Greg mentioned that keeping kind of most of the retail uh, in the core and the center business centers to create that activity that we want on our main streets is, is pretty critical. So if there is going to be a multi-family project, you know, having the ground floor be retail is, is kind of an important piece, um, I think, for the vibrancy of that neighborhood. Um, as you do get to the fringes, though, I think we've seen a lot of mistakes when municipalities requiring retail. Um, and I think Tim mentioned this, they require it, then developer builds it, there's not a lot of thought that goes into it, and you end up with space that sits vacant. Um, and usually that sits vacant because it's not well located, you know, in the kind of commercial core where you really want it. So um, I think that's, you know, two of the things I heard that made a lot of sense to me, and it seems like you're already kind of covering that, you know, that the fringes of these kind of downtown centers could actually Um, one other thing that may be worth thinking about, and I don't know how it would apply here, but um, we've seen incentives for if you do have commercial ground floor spaces, and I would suggest that it be viable ground floor space, that you do have an exemption on that space for FAR. So it's something to keep in mind, too, is like, you know, if they are adding, you know, a, a retail unit that has a restaurant or other kind of amenity that's adding to the neighborhood, then maybe there's an exemption for the FAR um, and you're able to build maybe a unit or two more right upstairs. Uh, yeah, that you can do within the rest of the time. So. We didn't go there yet. Yeah. You're the right place to jump in. I'm sorry for putting you on the spot, but thank you very much. That was a very helpful uh, piece of info. Um, is there anyone else in the room that has any other comments or questions? So let's chat just briefly before we wrap this up on uh, on the process. Uh, Lee or, or Katie or um, uh, Bill and Heidi, can one of you speak to what happens next, uh, the next community meeting? What is the next community meeting in March? Is that focused around one particular model and then uh, and then when does it go to the um, uh, to the state for their approval and then when does it go to the planning board for consideration and final drafting and public hearings and so forth I can take that um, so Hone's next steps really are we just had this community meeting on these three maps the same day that you saw last week so we're meeting on the 29th please tune in if you'd like um, Hone will be digesting all the feedback that we got at that community meeting and the survey that's been open since. And from this discussion, we'll be sharing um, what we've heard here back with Hone. And um, over the course of um, February, basically, Hone will have to come to a decision about taking those three scenarios and really consolidating down to one map and one plan. Now, there may be kind of some base compliance and then some add-on options, but the committee will have to discuss that 
And that March committee meeting is really where we come back with folks about where home landed from whittling that all down. So um, I will just say the timeline seems long to December, but decisions are going to be made much sooner than that in this home process, um, because really once we send it off to the state, um, like they, uh, it has to go end of April, um, at that point, they're pre-reviewing it so that we know it's compliant to go to town meeting. So the decisions have, have been kind of made at that point. So um, mentally, if you're thinking about, do I want to engage in this more? You know, that engagement really is now until mid-March. Um, and then from that point on, it's really just us dotting our eyes, crossing our T's, getting ready for a town meeting, make sure everything's legally compliant. That's really helpful. So feedback can be directed. I, I, I know for the planning board, the email address is planning at needhamma.gov. Um, yeah. Uh, is that right? Yes. 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 Okay. I've been saying it enough. I hope I got it right. And then oh. JP, uh, can you can you announce your email address so people can provide comment to you? <laughs> well, I have a shorter one. <laughs> so my email is J C A C C I A G <laughs> at needhamma.gov. It's not even his full name. Yeah. <laughs> we ended it about halfway through. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. Got my email. So and if uh, uh last call for any other questions or comments, uh then seeing none, uh this is the only item on our agenda. I would say uh we appreciate everyone's engagement and participation today. This has been helpful and instructive, I think. Um uh, we will have another uh, CEA meeting in February. This may partly be on the agenda at that time. I'm sure we will discuss it. Um, uh, look uh, to your emails uh, for um, uh, for uh, stay tuned for when that meeting will be and the agenda for that meeting. Uh, and again, you can reach out to either the planning department or JP with any additional specific feedback or any questions you have on a particular site. Um, and uh, with that, I think I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Do not amend Yes. Yes. For the for the uh, for the record, so we have a motion moved by Heidi to adjourn, a second by Lise. Was that you? I think it was Bob. Bob Hanson. Bob, Bob Hentel, we have a second by Bob Hentel. Any discussion? Hearing none, I'll come to uh, I'll come to the vote. Uh, I think because we're at least I'm remote, and actually I think Adam Meisner's remote. We will um, uh, we'll do the vote by uh, roll call. So when I call your name, please signify by saying uh, uh, aye or nay. Um, uh, Rick Puprush. Aye. Mike Wilcox. Aye. Lise Elcock. Aye. Bob Henschel. Aye. Uh, uh, I think Adam may, I don't know if Adam is able to hear me. If he Aye. is. I can. <laughs> Aye. Wonderful. Uh, Jeremy Halpern. Aye. Uh, Bill Day. Is Bill Day here? Uh, uh, yeah. And then uh, Dan Goodman. Aye. Uh, awesome. And then Kate. Aye. Uh, anyone else that I missed that's on the CEA that I... Aye. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Uh, thank you all very much. We've, uh, um, we've uh, sit adjourned. Thank you all. I'm not a